la innovación financiera parece venir cada vez más de competidores emergentes, no de los jugadores que han estado en esta industria por décadas. Se ha dicho que la banca tradicional es estupenda en procesos y que las fintech lo son en crear nuevas y mejores experiencias para el consumidor. Para discutirlo, es un honor presentar la mesa panel Traditional Banking vs. Fintech, Who Has the Last Word? Con los distinguidos panelistas, Angélica Arana, Vicepresidente de Operaciones, TI e Infraestructura en STP. Leticia Robles, Vicepresidente de Corporate Affairs en Confío. Luis Medina, Regional Manager de Murex Latinoamérica. José Antonio Murillo, CEO en Rappi Card. Bernardo Prum, CEO de Chris. Sergio Torres Lebrija, Director de Estrategia, Innovación y Banca Digital en BBVA México. Y como anfitrión, Brett King, destacado autor de Banking 4.0 y reconocido futurista del sector financiero. We welcome Angélica, Leticia, Luis, José Antonio, Bernardo, Sergio and Brett to the Digital Banking and Financial Technologies Forum 2023. Let me start um, with, with yourself. In terms of like the fintech versus um, banking um, discussion, how do you think fintech has changed banking on a global basis? Do you think... Uh, You know, do you think it has had an impact? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, Brad, uh, thank you very much for this uh, panel. Uh, I'm very happy to be here okay. with all the uh, these startups, fintechs, and, and companies. Uh, and, and yes, uh, obviously, uh, in Mexico and Latin America, uh, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, startups, fintechs, and big techs, no, uh, in the in the Mexican market, no. Uh, since the pandemic, no, uh, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, innovation, no, in basically all the industries, no, and obviously uh, 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 we see a huge opportunity in Mexico, obviously in Latin America, but in Mexico, uh, because uh, let, let me give you some numbers, no, you know, obviously uh, all this information. Uh, in Mexico, we are uh, 126 uh, million people, no. Approx uh, 90 million adults, okay? uh, 90 million uh, uh, smartphones, uh, but what we see a lot of opportunities uh, to bankarize people. No? Because financial inclusion is still below where it should be, right? Exactly. Uh, probably uh, more than uh, 40 million people are on bankarize, okay? and, and the 85% of uh, the, the transactions below. Uh, $24 are in cash. Imagine the opportunity uh, that we see in Mexico. Uh, we have been working in BBVA uh, uh, with uh, a lot of startups, fintechs, uh, in order to work together. No, We have a, 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 an open innovation uh, strategy, and we work together uh, with these startups, fintechs. Uh, we have been developing some partnerships uh, with uh, uh, startups, fintechs, and big techs in order to offer uh, our clients uh, the best uh, digital products. But BBVA has always been quite progressive te technically in terms of technology, but um, do you feel like um, the partnerships with the fintechs is uh, teaching the old dog new tricks? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah because uh, obviously uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of, uh, we have 29 uh, million clients in Mexico, Uh, we have been growing a lot uh, uh, the digitalization. Uh, in order to give you some numbers, uh, uh, we have uh, at this moment 20 million clients, uh -huh, digital clients, uh, which represent the 69% of the uh, of the clients. Okay, if we saw this number uh, uh, before the pandemic, uh, it was uh, 9 million. No, uh, we we increase a lot. Okay. But the 76% of our total sales are in digital uh, uh, means. Uh, we have been developing a lot of new products. No? Uh, uh, What about account opening? Do you have, uh, how much of that is digital these days? Uh, 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 pro probably the, the 65% yeah, of our total. It's about the same as the states. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Very good. 
Um, Angelica, um, I, I'll come back to the security question, but what are the challenges that fintechs are facing competing with no, the traditional banks? And, um, you know, um, what are the advantages they have, you think? Well, I, I think one of the, the, the first one is the regulatory... Uh, the regulatory... Compliance, response. yes, because um, the fintechs uh, are subject to the same, or almost the same, regulatory compliance that the banks have. And it's difficult for, for us to uh, to fulfill all them, all of them, and it's, it's very it's something that we uh, must um, develop because we we require uh, to attract these compliance exper experts to help us to to do this 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 task, and and also I, I think um, beyond the, the regulatory one, I, I think. Other one is the customer acquisition, because traditional banks has a, um, a very huge uh, base of, of uh, customers, and we must uh, work harder to to attract uh, customers and, and retain them. And, and I think is uh, the, the difference that we have is that we must uh, have this superior ex customer experience in order to to my to maintain these, these customers. And another one I think is, is the funding, because we require a significant funding to develop and scale our, our products, for example. And it's common that the investor hesitates to give us their money, because they don't know, they don't know uh, if our model is going to, to work or not. And it's something that we because of that, we, we need to um, to build this uh, very solid um, business case in order to, to show the, the profitability of, of our uh, business, for example. Another one is the, the technology infrastructure, for example, también because um, we require a, a very uh, strong infrastructure and is costly and also is, is complex to have it. So we, we must be partnered with, with, the, with several providers in order to, to have this, this infrastructure that, that sustain our, our systems. And, and finally, I think the, the other one is the, the, the brand recognition, for example. Because also the, the banks have this, this uh, recognition that is, the brand is, is very uh, well known, and we are known in, in, in very uh, sectors, and, and this is, is something that we must um, work harder in, in, for example, in, in public relations, in this market, uh, market in marketing, and, and share with with all of, of the people around what is what we are doing. I saw a fintech uh, uh, industry report uh, yesterday that said 57% of uh, the fintech's effort goes into acquisition. Yes. You know, which you know, is an unusual number, but I think it sounds about right. Bernardo, um, you know, as, a, as a founder, um, I, didn't, I didn't check with you this question beforehand, so I, I hope it's OK, because uh, I'll tell you my answer to this. Uh, how much time, how much of your job is raising raising money for the, the fintech? Okay, fantastic. Hello, on, uh, thank, thank you much for your, for your question and for the invitation. Thank you all so much. I mean, I think that is, a, the, I think that is the key thing. When, when you talk about what's pros and cons between the fintechs and the bank, I think our, our great pro that we have as a fintech, you mentioned all our cons and I agree completely, but we have culture. We have culture and we have innovation. I, I, am, I admire Vancouver completely because as Brett said, you have been able to innovate and I, I am a Vancouver uh, User, I have Vancouver in my... Vancouver or BBVA? BBVA. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, so you guys give me a hard time. Yeah. The, the brand sticks. Okay. Um, yeah, so you've been able to innovate, and, and I think banks, that, that's, we, we have all these problems. We, it's very hard to get clients, it's very hard to be profitable, it's very hard to prove our model, but we are able to innovate. We have this culture of innovation because the banks don't have it. The banks, with all due respect, are established companies that have something that works, and it's, it's a bunch of people, to my opinion, they're very afraid, and they should be. They have these huge <laughs> companies, and they're very afraid to touch anything they can break. 
because you have millions of clients, you have people looking at you, and, and we don't. We are, nobody knows, they call us Chris, we're with Chris, and nobody knows, nobody knows what, our, what our name is, and we have that to our advantage, so we can make experiments, that so we can test out, that so we can do different things. So I think that is our key advantage. And when you, when you talk about regulation, of course, but I think that is our key advantage too, because if they want to do something, they have to do 24 meetings, call 100 lawyers, and every time I go to a meeting in a bank, it's 400 people sitting in a room, like, what the hell are all these guys doing? And with us, it's like me, Kik is right there, like my guy from credit, we just have a conversation and we move ahead, you know? So I think that's our advantage. But as you well mentioned, 60% of our customer acquisition. Yeah, yeah. That's not a sustainable model. And I think that's going it's to change tough. Yeah. very quickly. If, if, if we're a sustainable model, we should, we should be spending money on product, on rates, on technology, not on getting new customers. So I think Crece and the rest of the, and our fintechs too, our challenge this year, now that funding has dried up, it's about, well, Okay, you can you can use the internet and you can have an app, but can you build this thing profitably and without losing money? And I think all of our competitors um, have been losing a lot of money over the last couple of years. And your advantage cannot be raising money, not anymore. Your advantage has to be who can implement technology better, be, be it a fintech, operational quickly. efficiency, yes. like who can make quickly. the runway last. These are now things we're hearing from founders. How can you tell Bernardo is a, a fintech founder? Right, because we have a dress code of business formal for the event, and he, he comes as, as a as right? as <laughs> But this is this like this is the thing I find when I go to like Europe or even in New York as a as a founder. You know, when I dress up as a speaker, but that's part of. But as the founder, I would often go with a t-shirt. You know, and uh, um, you know, this is this is part of the cultural. Uh, difference between the fintechs and the traditional players is it's not important what you wear it's important what you do in the business right you know so uh, it, it's it, it's nice to see you represent the, uh, the crowd um, uh, from a rapid car perspective you have to bridge these two worlds you're obviously you know born from a fintech rapid okay but you partner with a traditional bank. Um, and uh, um, you know, Sergio mentioned before this increasing intent for banks to partner with fintechs, but there is a cultural divide, not just the t-shirts we wear. You know, um, we have a tech stack at the fintechs, whereas the banks have core systems. You know? We're in the cloud 100%. You know? We digital acquisition 100%. Um, so uh, how, how do you... Um, navigate those two different culture sets um, and, and bring that together at Rapica? That's a very good question, Brett. And uh, although people seldom believe in fairy tales, they do happen. There are marriages made in heaven. <laughs> and, and this is one of those cases where you can have both of best worlds because you have the passion and the velocity to deliver awesome customer experience. And uh, really after two years, we have one of the highest NPS in the market, if not the highest. According to the data from the central bank, our NPS is more than double. That's the net promoter score. So that's unbelievable for a firm that's been for two years in the market. We are acquiring our customers at, 5 of, at a five percentage cost of what our regular bank does. So yes, there are marriages made in heaven. Plus, we have the expertise and the knowledge from the And I guess, as every good marriage happens to work, there, is, there has to be a deep respect from both partners so that that can come true. But, but where are the challenges? Where have you... I, I guess I guess one of the, the challenges that uh, and I think you've talked about it is the view of a startup it's more on a longer term it's you're looking to build for something that will be profitable in 10 years right it's not you're trying to solve a problem issue. you're trying to really change uh, the way a bank works and how you solve financial problems for the customer. You're not really trying to make a buck for the quarter. So that's, it's, it's a different time frame in which you're thinking, and that requires a lot of conversations between, between the partners on what you're trying to build. 
And for a bank that is going deep into these type of partnerships, they should be thinking that they are doing something different than what they are doing typically in their core business or usual business. Otherwise, why do it? Absolutely. Leticia, um, we've talked about uh, you know, decentralized financial services. Sergio raised the issue of the unbanked in, uh, in Mexico. And of course, this is an issue across Latin. Um, and so there's been this um, sort of mission that fintech has taken on to democratize uh, financial services and access to financial services. Do you think that fintechs have made a, a, a big dent in, in that? And, and how has access to financial services changed because of the advent of fintech? Yes, um, I, I, I really believe that fintechs that will make a dent are the ones that really um, have this promise near their core. I mean, the, the access to financial services and to broadband, to Wi-Fi, it's not universal in Mexico, right? Right. So the gap is big. If, if, when we talk about financial services or unbanked, unbanked populations, there's different gaps depending if it's credit, if it's insurance, if it's remittances, if it's a bank account, so say it depends. Where we're at, Confio, um, its first product was credit, right? So we, we are experts in, in identifying this gap in, in access to credit and targeting medium-sized, medium and um, medium, small and medium enterprises that need credit that usually, traditionally, they were um, not attended by traditional players. Why? Because you needed more complex algorithm mo models with more data points than parametric, parametric traditional models. So um, this, this complexity is a lot of experimentation. So getting to the point, I think that there is still a lot of space to make a dent. Experimentation has been going on, but studies tell, tell us that we're on a good path. For example, yesterday we released a study, well, IDV Invest released a study um, that was uh, researched on Confuse portfolio with anonymous data, obviously, um, and studying what happens if a, a company is given a credit from Confio. So two years studying these companies, lots of data, lots of statistical is the, uh, amounts of, of companies that were studied, and then the study that I invite you all to read, which is, is the, available since yesterday, says that after giving, their, giving them credit, companies grow overall in 19%. But if you go double click, because also the beauty of experimentation of, and of models that we use is that you can do double click in, in different uh, uh, data points, for example, gender. If you do double click on gender, then you can see that women-led companies grew 40% versus the ones that didn't receive credit or received credit in worse conditions. This means that, that really credit is um, uh, it's, uh, it's gasoline or for growth and Confio is an enabler for growth and I can speak for Confio. I think that if we become, a, o sea, the, the, the size of the tent also has to do with the size of the company or the companies. If the experiments turn right like this one, then I see a lot of potential in doing, in, 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 in doing a big dent in the financial system in Mexico. I'm, as you are, optimistic, super optimistic. And I also think we wake up every day because of purpose. So purpose is the number one thing in Confio. And we're not, so we're, we're super focused on going after that purpose. Luis, you're old school fintech, right? Right. Murex has been around for what, 30? 36 possibly? years. 36 years, yeah. right. So, um, now, when we talk about 
the sort of next generation of financial services, we're, we are talking not only about new brands and, and new experiences, but we are talking about a very different infrastructure, te technological. Right. All of the fintechs operate in the cloud. You know, um, banks are trying to do some stuff in the cloud now, but you know, there's a, you know, when we were at a bank, we talk about our core systems, right? You don't ever hear a fintech talk about core systems. They talk about their tech stack. Um, uh, so, um, in terms of sort of the infrastructure play, I know you do a lot more work with capital markets, but um, I presume you're working with both fintechs and uh, traditional banks. So, from a technology perspective, how does that change the way Murex thinks about their technology stack? So, basically, Murex, it's, uh, as you said, right, it's kind of like the first uh, generation of fintechs, right? It's 36 years old. And we, we basically serve uh, the traditional players of the market, basically sell sides, buy sides, you know, asset managers. Um, of course, we were, uh, at the start, everything was going with our traditional clients well. And when the new generation of fintech appeared, it was a disruption, right? There were a lot of lessons learned we had from that. Like, we had, for instance, to embrace the new technologies. You were saying, right, fintechs are all cloud, all stack, they don't, they don't care about core systems. Well, even though our system is still considered a core system for financial markets, for capital markets, we had to embrace that, those technologies, right? Now, uh, we're in the third version of our, our product. Murex only has one product, it's called MX3. It serves for every type of client, and it has been, in, uh, let's say, updated or, uh, for all types of new technologies. So now we are cloud, we also have uh, software as a service, right? We also have all the API, API REST, all the uh, web client uh, uh, platform. So actually, what we had to do is basically embrace this new wave of fintechs, right? At the beginning, it seemed like it might be a threat for the for our current uh, client base. We thought it might be actually a threat. But we have seen that banks have also been adaptive to it, right? And we have also had to be adapted to, to those kind of uh, changes uh, about that uh, technology infrastructure, right? Do, um, I'll throw this question to the panel openly. Um, but do, do you think that we are starting to see, you know, in terms of maturation of the sector, more fintechs and more banks coming together? Because, yep. you know, 10 years ago it was banks versus fintechs, which is the theme of the panel today. But um, uh, you know, uh, why do you think that, that this uh, tendency for banks and fintechs to come together is, seems to be accelerating right now? Any thoughts? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Um, oh, okay. I mean, I'll, I'll give you my thoughts. I mean, I think in the long term, we have to converge. It's, it's like asking who's going to win, uh, Barnes & Nobles or Amazon? I mean, right. at, at the end, it's like, as you will say, but like, who's thinking about this in first principles? and who is able to apply those first principles and focus on the consumer and give a better product. If it's coming from the bank, they have their pros and they have their cons, and if it's coming from the fintechs, they have their pros and we have our cons. I think we have, we, we have time where we could be unprofitable. Chris is now profitable, so we have to stick by the long-term rules. And you had a time when you could just focus on your brand and focus on your current clients and, and still ask people to come to a bank and sign a piece of paper, and because we're competing, we're trying to converge. So I think in the end, it's not who, it's not who's a fintech or not, so who has a better product and who's able to, to adapt to this? Who's going to be the blockbuster and who's going to be like the, the Netflix, no? Yeah, and one of the ways fintechs are going after revenue is also with the banks, you know, the banks have, have got money. So, Sergio, um, you mentioned before about the pandemic accelerating the digitization. Um, in, in the US, we saw that the top banks who had digitized they gained some customers uh, during the pandemic. And the fintechs gained lots of customers during the fintech. But the banks who really hadn't invested in digitization struggled during the fintech. Uh, I mean, sorry, during uh, the pandemic, right? Um, so how, how do you think um, the, the acceleration we saw in digital adoption during the pandemic, um, how has that changed the the sector generally, and do you think that that's going to stay, or are we going to go back to the way it was before? No, that's going to stay and to increase, no? Uh, le let me give you some uh, numbers. Uh, we launched 
uh, our uh, digital strategy eight, eight years ago in, in BBVA uh, worldwide. Okay, uh, we have been growing a lot. Uh, in order to give you some numbers, uh, from uh, in probably uh, probably seven years ago, the 100 percent of our transactions in branches we have. Uh, 1,700 branches, uh, the 100% was in branches, okay? Uh, uh, before the pandemic, uh, probably the 20% of our total transactions wa was in, in branches, okay? And at this moment, just the 5% of our transactions are in branches, okay? Uh, the 32% is uh, in ATMs and practicajas, okay? And the 62% uh, is in, 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 in mobile, basically, uh, in, in electronic banking. But if we see this number uh, four years ago, uh, before the pandemic, uh, it was the, 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 uh, just 32%. We double uh, if, if, if before, if after the pandemic uh, the, the digital transactions. Obviously, we really think uh, that we have a huge opportunity because it's not just to increase the number of digital transactions with our 29 million customers, okay? Because we see a lot of opportunities, uh, 45 million uh, uh, people on Bank Arise in Mexico, and we have a huge opportunity uh, for all the players in this uh, uh, market, okay? Not just for banks, for startups, for fintechs, for big techs. Uh, that's why uh, we have been seeing a lot of investments in, in, in Mexico, in Latin America, uh, and, and, and I really see a huge opportunity for all. Uh, I, I, uh, we have been uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, partnerships uh -huh, with startups, fintechs, big techs, and uh, we acquire, for example, OpenPay uh, to offer uh, SMEs, enterprises, corporates, and, 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 and governments, uh, e-commerce, and a lot of solutions uh, for payments, okay? Uh, we have been uh, uh, making a lot of alliances uh -huh, uh, for a lot of things, okay? And, and I really think that there, there is a, a, a huge space for everybody, no? And, and um, do you feel, I know Big VBA has always been quite progressive, but do you feel that, um, you know, like uh, Jose was talking about before with RapiCard and, and partnerships with FinTech, have you had to, um, you know, change your culture to bring in fintechs? Uh, do you have a special team that works within BBVA to, to onboard uh, fintech partners? How does that work? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, we have our open innovation uh, strategy, and, and we have been de developing a lot of uh, 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 strategies, like the hackathon, for example. We invited more than 800 uh, uh, people uh -huh, uh, to develop uh, challenges. Okay, uh, we also have the open talks and other events. And, and, and in this kind of events, uh, uh, we have been acquiring a lot of companies. And we also, uh, we saw the opportunity in this market. And, and as you mentioned before, uh, we need to understand better uh, the startups and fintechs. That's why uh, we launched our Spark uh, area uh, last year in Spain in, in Mexico. Uh, and we launched also in Colombia. And this specific area will attend the startups and fintechs, okay? Uh, we are going to work together with the startups and fintechs in order to give them uh, all the financial services and to support these startups and fintechs in their growing. And Do you invest in fintechs as well? Yes, yes. That's good, yes. that's admirable. I and think this that's is, the way you can learn as a big bank. Yeah, and this is, this is new, and I completely agree with you that probably two or three years ago, uh, we cannot understand very well the startups and fintechs, but nowadays uh, that's why we launched this uh, Spark uh, area, no? And this is going to be very important for the for the ma market in, in Spain and in Latin America. We, we just applied for a bet for a long line, so we just applied for a line in Spark. So please make a call. Okay. The crazy guy is cool. You can okay. do it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Well, now he's your friend. So. Maybe exactly. Yes. After, after the Spark uh, strategy, you are my friend. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is a question we didn't prepare before, but um, uh, you know, in, in terms of the marriage of fintech and, and the banking, we see a lot of this requires technical alliance, technical uh, you know, uh, uh, merger. 
Um, and so cloud strategy is very important for this. You, know, you can't really have a fintech partnership on premise, you know, um, even if it is private cloud implementation. Um, most fintechs, when they're deploying tech into a, into a traditional bank, it's, uh, it's with cloud. Where does cloud sit um, in terms of, um, you know, like our thinking in, in, in respect to where this all goes and, uh, you know, how important is investment in the cloud generally for, for the industry to make? What do you guys think? So, at, at least, for, uh, you know, we serve all, my region is LATAM, so I am in charge of Mexico to Argentina, all the countries there. What we have seen lately, all the opportunities we have been achieved, all the new, you know, uh, institutions in the, in the market that are looking actively for a new solution, they are 100% invested on cloud services, you know, on cloud solutions. Nobody else, at least in LATAM, is asking for on-premise. Uh, all our old clients that have on-prem solutions are asking to upgrade to a cloud. So basically, I think the trend is clear, right? It's right. nothing else to do. Like, that's good to hear. Yes, yeah. that, that's, that, yeah. that's the it's trend. It's a relief, right? right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think the regulator's posture on this has changed over the last few years as well, right? It depends on the country. It really depends on the country. Like, for instance, Colombia, it's very flexible on this. Like, in Colombia, you can move to the cloud and the, and the actual data can be anywhere and the regulator allows it. So it's easier for uh, institutions in Colombia to basically go cloud. Other countries are more restrictive. Other regulatory bodies, maybe in Mexico or maybe in, in Argentina or Chile, are a little bit more restrictive, right? So it's basically a case-to-case -case once we engage with a client trying to go to cloud to see if it's also available for, for them in their regulation, in their jurisdiction, right? Yeah, I mean, some regulators still insist that you must have your availability zones Correct. for servers in country. You or can't have uh, customer data stored out of country. And exactly. Thing, but yeah. um, Angelica, um, on that issue of the cloud, on the, the security side, um, you know, we, we have in Mexico the real-time payments infrastructure um, you know, uh, is, is obviously accelerating here so that banks and fintechs alike are, are integrated into these, uh, these systems. So where does the role of security fit? And... You know, does cloud have an advantage from a security perspective? I, I think yeah, we are in, in, the, in the trust business, isn't it? Because financial services are... Uh, financial services is in... Is the, the security is, is a crucial issue because, for example, I, I, security protocols are critical for financial inclusion and even for the adoption and growth of uh, payment, digital payments, right. isn't it? Uh, because even when, when you said that with the pandemic, many, many of us go to digital, the, the thing is that even in Mexico, many, many people hesitate to, to go to digital uh, environment because they, they are um, they they are concerned about uh, about the security and and the privacy. Of, of uh, uh, that. Do you do you think that's still the case? Um, you know, I, Jose I, Jose just said that they got a higher net promoter score. New Bank is more trusted yes. than many of the banks. Sorry, Sergio. Um, you know, um, <laughs> and in China, Alipay and WeChat Pay have higher trust ratings than the banks yes, in China. It's, it's contradictory because. I don't know what, what, what do you think, but even when we see that this number grows, it, it also, we have that, that the, the people uh, go, go down to the, to the use of, of some platforms. And, and I think that, that there is where security is important because if we don't do our task, if we don't do uh, this, the, the financial system secure, they are going to, to go back and, and do it in, in cash. And, and some platforms even uh, include payment in cash because, because the, the, the people require that. And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's because we, we, we need to, to do this, this education about how secure is, is, is the 
uh, are now the, the systems and the, and the payments. And, and this is part of, of our task as financial institutions. Because if we do the, this system secure and prevent about the, prevent the, to the fraud and, and prevent to the cyber attacks, we, we, we build this, this confidence and this trust of, of, our, of our customers and they are going to, to go back to the digital, to the digital area. And, and I think it's, it's something that is, is, is fundamental and, and for, our, for our, our, all of us. And I, I don't know if, but I think every, everybody yeah. here is, Agreed. is taking care of Same. the security in, in, in our... It, it, it is a hygiene country. factor. Yes. Yeah. yes. But Bernardo, um, I'll, I'll get to you in a moment, Jose, but Bernardo, how do you, how do you deal with this? How do you give your customers uh, confidence in the brand given your... Uh, you know, a new kid on the block as a fintech. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. It's a challenge that we all face with. It's, it's very curious. In our case, we are SME, provide loans to SMEs. So we, we give money and still clients come to us and like, I don't trust you. It's like, I'm trying to give you money, man. Like, <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you trust me? But the, I think, and as to your point correctly, I mean, I think our competitors are, are, not, are, are not each other. Our competitors are all of the frauds, all of the narcos, right. all of the, uh, the lack of regulation. We are completely constantly attacked by people that claim to be us and make a, a copy of our website. So it all comes down to making sure that when we do get a client, when we do get somebody that comes interact with us, we give them a great experience and we, and we focus on this NPS score all the time because that is our, our brand and that is the only way that we can slowly start to trust in them. Of course, we have partnerships and, and of course, a lot of we try to build out and we use STP, and we use PBA, and we, use, we try to use different parts of the sector that have been trusted, and we can piggyback on that. But I would love to hear. I think, I think there are two points. First, it's, a, it's an issue of perception. And, and uh, there, there's one size does not fit all. There are differences between generations and, uh, and uh, wealth, education makes a difference. But for example, the customers of RapiCard, 80% of them are less than 35 years old. It is evident that the younger generation feels very comfortable doing business with a digital bank. Yeah. It's, it's they don't necessarily ask those questions like, do you, you know, they, they, don't, they don't care if you have a banking charter or not, or if the card's issued by a bank partner. It, it, it is something that is very natural to them. And what it's not natural, and it's because it was designed that way to go to a branch. And let me tell you a quick story about my, my own son. He's proud, proud dad. My, my son just graduated from Harvard College, so he must be kind of smart. He went to open a, a, a bank account at a traditional bank. He spent like about three hours. He needed to do that for his business because he's also like that. He's doing his own startup, whatever. But and I asked him, so what? What it takes so much time? And he kind of in the U.S. Crazy. No, in the U.S. No, no, no. Here mm -hmm. in Mexico. Yes. Unfortunately, <laughs> I want. I want to, the Big Bank. I, I will. Uh, but the thing is that I, at the end, he didn't make a deposit. After three hours, and I, I, and I asked him, so why did you make a deposit? He said, well, the ATM couldn't take, take the cash. I told him, well, there's the teller, the human teller. He said, well, I never thought about it. Yeah. So, so it's the younger generations. Because he thinks digitally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and, and they don't feel, they don't feel insecure about dealing with a platform that has so much at stage, uh, a super app like Rapid Card that has, like Rapid that has a travel business, a, de a delivery business, a pharmacy business. We have a bunch of different businesses that you have a reputation to care in a lot of lines. So it's, they feel comfortable with that. It's kind of like, like the older generation that still has an issue in, what if I order, I make an order from a delivery and they don't bring me hamburger and it's like, well, it's like 50 pesos that are at risk. It's not really <laughs> like it's your house. And on the other hand, so you have a question of perception and my impression is that what will happen is that the younger generation 
it's adapting at a faster rate and the older guys are going to follow. And then the other issue is the real security. And it turns out that suddenly it's much more safer to be doing transactions in the digital world when you have a dynamic CVV right. than when you're using a physical card. And it's hard for people to think, and I'm going to a branch and there are a lot of people that have access to my information and I write on a, you know, I use a wet signature to, uh, to and it's a bunch of different papers and it's suddenly, it's, it just seems ridiculous that you feel safer going to a branch and exposing all that information that doing... But uh, we have seen business. for the first time since, like, you know, the pandemic has produced a contraction in branches across Latin America. Um, Mexico is a little slower, but Brazil has seen a rapid uh, reduction in, in branches. And, you know, in, even in Argentina, we're talking about the ghost branches now, these branches that the unions are forcing the central bank to keep open, but still no one is visiting them. You know, so um, and, and, it seems and like have, it's working. And you have a political economy problem at, at, within traditional banks, is that you have a lot of positions that have, you know, high ups that are responsible for the branches, and, uh, and it's very hard to tell, uh, you know, a big wig that he's... His business, he's going to be successful yeah. as long as he closes the, the business that he's But the target. economics of branching has sort of fundamentally changed because of digital as well. That's part of the implication, right? Sergio? Yeah, and that's a, a why we, we change our distribution model. As I told you before, uh, the 95% of our, our transactions uh, are uh, outside uh, the branch. And that's why uh, uh, we open uh, digital accounts in three minutes, no? Uh, in order to, to eliminate these bureaucratic uh, uh, digital uh, uh, accounts in, in branches uh, for one hour or 30 minutes. But, but that's, mm -hmm. you make a good point there, because you know, digital account opening on a, on a wrapping card is going to be two or three minutes. But if you're an SME trying to open a bank account, well, that's tougher, right? You know, and, um, like three hours is bad, right? <laughs> but uh, Letitia, um, where does digital inclusion fit into this? Because you know, if we are moving away from branches and we're moving to digital account opening, and the young people are, are looking at that, um, how is digi you know digital inclusion uh, you know a precursor for financial inclusion? Well, I think that financial inclu inclusion it's an and digital inclusion, it's a means to an end, right? So the end that we want to achieve by doing both that, digital inclusion and financial inclusion, one after the other, is economic growth. So I see both of them as enablers of growth. So what I see in the future, if, if, if what we think will come true, will come, does come true, is that we will have a, a country that will grow and become more, uh, is the, that, that is economic growth, because Mexico still has space of economic growth. There's countries that have a problem, right? That they're thinking in degrowth because of their population. Mexico does not have a problem, has an opportunity, has a demographic bonus, so we still are on the growth side. Um, so by, including digitally the people that are excluding, then you will get financial inclusion and then you get what we all want, that's economic growth. And not only economic growth, but sustainable economic growth. I would add that word. That's what, is, what is the, you said 90% smartphone adoption? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So Mexico is doing pretty well. Yeah, it's doing pretty well. I think that's higher than the US, actually. And 80, having, 80 million having, uh, uh, WhatsApp uh, users. Right. But, that's, but having that's a huge. mobile phone, phone does not guarantee all inclusion. No, no. But it's because, for example, credit. Or say, if you go to SME credit, it's 13% the penetration as a percentage of the GDP. That's low. Compared to the U.S., the U.S. is 120% as a percentage of their GDP. So, um, but let's not compare ourselves with the U.S., right? So let's compare us with a country like Chile, maybe, and right. it's 70%. So then there is space, even if they have a phone. 
The other problem we haven't talked about is if you look at financial exclusion in countries like the United States, a lot of that has to do with the documentary requirements. I agree. You know? um, so what are we doing about that in Latin America in terms of making it easier for people to get an identity, a formal identity, so they can be included? I think that's a vision. O sea, I think that's visionary, right? And for example, the case of India has a lot to teach us of, of a, a universal or a countrywide um, um, identity. Be a dark heart, yes. Be a yes. See, for me, I, I, I admire what India has done. And it, it's a, a really st a strategy that attacks the problem from different angles. Its identity is use of cash, or say demonetization, the India stack, right? And everybody on board. So I think in terms of also financial inclusion and digital inclusion, identity is a big, a big, a big theme that we, together with the government and the regulators, we have to, to, to crack the code for Mexico, right? Because maybe the recipe, it's not the same. We, we shouldn't do a copycat. But yes, we have to, I mean, as you were saying, I heard you in, in, at lunch saying um, a signature, it's not really um, like something that really identifies a person. I totally agree. I, I, so we have still a road to, to travel together with the regulators in that aspect. I, I think See. there's something very important because the identity and, and know that the person is, is, the, is really a person and owns the, the money, for example, is something that we, we have a, a lot of space to, to, to work Compared. here in Mexico because we, we don't have a, 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 a single identity here. Yeah. We, we have a lot of... Okay. Um, and, and I think it's, it's something that... Um, for example, Banxico has in, in the, the, the strategy uh, uh, a project about the, the identity of, the, of the, per, the, the people here in Mexico. And I think it's, it's, it's some, something crucial because for, it, it depends, on, um, for example, the payments, the, the, the open an, an, an account, and many, many things in, in, in the financial system is, is around the, identif the, the identification of the, of, the, of, the, of the person, isn't it? But, you know, here's one of the really interesting aspects of this is if you look at digital account opening or, you know, the fintechs, digital onboarding, fintechs were the ones that developed identity verification technology. Yeah. They were the ones that asked for this tech and, the, you, know, um, you know, vendors were created for this. The banks weren't the ones driving digital identity verification, as an example. Yeah. Right? I'm sorry to say, sir. And, and, and the banks use this, this, this fintech to, to... Yeah, we had an agreement with yes. uh, fintech uh, yeah. in order to make all the uh, identity of yes. our clients. That's another example yeah, of yeah. the partnership that, yes, that we have. absolutely. Well, this is, I think, uh, you know, one of those examples from a, an infrastructure perspective where we, yeah. see, we see these. What about uh, for Murex? Have you guys, mm -hmm. um, you know... Ha yeah, have you found some benefit in terms of the developments in the cloud and on fintechs in terms of things like digital IDV? Sure, I mean, in the sense that uh, all these developments are helping the new uh, neo banks or digital no, banks. And these banks at the end of the day Mexican. can be potential clients to us, right? So basically, all these uh, fintech Mexican developments are embedded inside of the way these uh, new bank, digital banks are, 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 are being created. And at the same time, if you see most of the traditional banks, are creating their own new digital banks. There are a lot of, like, uh, I can, you know, Bank Colombia, Neki in Chile, there is a bank called BCI, and it has much. So what we are seeing is, of course, uh, in our tool, in no, our software, we have not, uh, let's say, in, uh, added these, like, features because it doesn't make sense. It is a capital market, right? We do, we do, like, forwards, and there you go, like that. But we see that this is important for the potential clients in these new institutions that are showing up because they can, they are actually making the market dynamic, right? And they can be potentially our clients if they one time decide, you know, all these digital banks go to a capital market and start, like, trading 
no options and derivatives and that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so we've got a, a, a few minutes left. There's two, two questions I want to cover off. Um, the first is, uh, and, and, and you know, whoever would like to jump in, the, the war for talent. You know, how do you attract people into your team? Maybe, Bernardo, maybe you, you talk about that. You know, um, how do you attract talent into, into the FinTech? Well, right now, everybody's getting fired, so, so they just come to us. <laughs> but um, it definitely, that's definitely the key challenge. The key difference is who, in the end, who has the better people are the ones who are going to make it at the end. And I think that the last speaker, I mean, he nailed it. I mean, the young generation, and it's weird now, I feel like I'm, I'm an old guy now, but the young generation, it's, way, it's not anymore about uh, you're going to have this job security and you're going you're gonna to have this salary, you're going to keep going. It's, 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 that's a part of it, but as you all mentioned, uh, Confio is like, what is the purpose? What is the purpose of this company? What is my, how, how sustainable is it going to be? Are we really doing financial inclusion or is it just about the bottom line? So it's about well, our key challenge is how to make a business that is profitable. But the, and, and that's the reason that I'm in it as well. And I think the people in this panel, in, in this panel as well. It's, I'm, I'm in it because it's a mission and it's a purpose. And how can we share that mission with everybody in the, everybody in the company that, yes, we're here to make a profit, but we're also here to make an impact. And we're also here to to enjoy the process of doing it, but I would do is, is the working from home thing become a bigger deal now? Uh, we don't have an office. We, I, have, I have one desk, and that's where all of Chris, all of Chris operates. We, we, we meet once in a while, and I think it's been... I so mean, mostly it's virtual. virtual. Mostly. Yeah. Like, uh, the same. But I couldn't agree more with Bernardo. I think people are in search of meaning, and at the end of the day, people want to use in something that it has, has a bigger purpose, yeah. as, as you're saying, of their time. At the end, you know, we have a limited amount of time in this life, and uh, until we crack the engineering problem, we <laughs> live eternally. But in the meantime, we're going to die at some point, and you better. Yeah. Be so, who would you rather work for? Doing a good use of that time. The FinTech. Bank. <laughs> or a regulator. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, with, with the five minutes left, I'd like to get all your perspectives on this. Is Let's go five, ten years out. Um, you know, what, is it, what does the mix look like? What does the ecosystem look like? Fintechs versus banks. Who are going to be the largest players? You know, um, what, what are your thoughts? Do you want to kick us off? Sure. Luis. So uh, when you think about the system, like a system, right, like uh, like ecosystem, yeah. like the current wave of uh, fintech, I think they actually improve the system. They make it more efficient. You know, like they attack like uh, part so of they the push all the standards. Every, exactly, and the competi competitiveness, you know, of the traditional banks and new banks. So it's good, right? Even though it's changing our system, um, it's our. It's going to be the same system. What I think is going to happen in the next five or ten years is going to be that it's going gracias. to happen that a new wave si of fintechs, but develop or si no disruption, hay, you know, decentralized money, decentralized business, everything on these like smart contracts and blockchain, uh, sí. you know, those ones are ones that are going to trade that current system. So, I so think the fintech boom know. is just getting started. Yeah, and they're going to be two waves, right? Like these ones sí, are like a pro system, like they are right, actually improving our current system. There are going to come Entonces, some that are going to actually create the way we work and we operate now. So in 10 years, I don't know, I hope we like... We're AI there. fintechs could be a whole boom, right? <laughs> yeah. A whole new boom. AR yeah. fintechs, augmented exactly. reality, yeah. metaverse fintechs. <clears throat> what do you think? So? As, as I mentioned before, I, I really think that there is a huge space for uh, everybody, not everybody. Uh, we are going to see a lot of uh, uh, consoli <laughs> consolidation <laughs> of a On lot both of, sides, right? uh, of both sides, exactly. Uh, uh, one of the examples is, for example, uh, Banorte with, uh, uh, with uh, Rappi. No? Uh, we are going to see uh, mm -hmm. so, some example like this uh, between startups, between you fintechs. You think Rappi's going to buy Banorte? <laughs> <laughs> probably, yeah. But, uh, I mean, so if I bought a bank in the US. Yeah, so. probably, probably, yes. Nu is a new player in the market, a digital bank. Uh, but, but I really see a lot of space for innovation. In data, for example, uh, uh, for example, in super apps, uh, uh, Asia, it's a, a very good example of uh, the opportunities that you, you, we, get, we can see in Latin America. Uh, you mentioned blockchain. Uh, there is a huge space also in blockchain. 
sustainability. Uh, for for yeah, BBVA, there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah, yeah for yeah. BBVA, the new wave of uh, uh, innovation no, is one of our six main priorities uh, worldwide, and we are going to see a lot of space there in artificial intelligence. Uh, we, we are going to see a lot of innovation there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jose? I think in 10 years' time, you will have to think of a new title for Bank 4.0, and it's not going to be something different than Bank. Yes. Banks will morph into something that will be solving problems for people in the right. sense that people will, it's not something that you're going to, something that it's kind of like, like an unnatural deviation of what we have of banks that are, you need, you want a car or you want to, to purchase a meal. What, what's the then, number one thing a bank should do for you as a customer? It should solve your money problems. So right? that you can live stress-free. And, yeah. and, it's some, it's and, and um, that's ge not generally the case. You know, banks haven't even over the last you know, 30 years, they haven't been designed to help you save. <coughs> because credit cards have been designed to make you spend money, right? And they've created a lot of stress to a lot of the customers. Yeah. And that's why the NPSs are so low. Because yes. people are haggling with the... With the I with have the a with numbers, no? <laughs> <laughs> No. I've heard someone else say something like that, and I don't believe it. <laughs> um, Leticia, what do you think? I'll go five years, years in the... Five, ten? Five, five, ten? Yeah, well, yeah. five years. Five. Okay, five years. I agree with consolidation, yes. I think that partnerships that are going to be really... Because what I've heard right now is partnerships where the bank learns a lot. But I think that partnerships should be two-way, right? O sea, there should be a win-win not only acquisitions, not only transferring talent, but really something that is um, valuable for both parties. If you crack the co code on that, maybe this one is the first one of many, then there will be super interesting partnerships, right? Second, um, they go third, I'm super bullish on AI. Maybe I'm biased because it's what I do, and it was, this was before ChatGPT, but I'm super bullish and continue to be bullish that the Bank or fintech, that doesn't matter, that does well AI will, will become uh, an important thing. Huge strategic advantage over the next few years. Mm -hmm. Angelica, and then we'll get Bernardo to finish. Yes, up. well, I, I agree with, with all because I think we, we are going to be more, to see more collaboration. Uh, we are going to help each other. If, if you don't collaborate, Technically and conceptually, you'll be out, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and we, 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 need, we need each other to, to, to achieve our goals and also to, to give our customer a better experience and, and the services and, and the products that they really require. And, and I think it's, it's the name of the game is, is collaboration. Where are you guys going to be in five years, Multi-billion. You'd be IPO by that. <laughs> Ring the bell, hopefully. Yeah, um, yes. Hopefully, hopefully alive. I mean, I think what's going to happen is a lot of fintechs are going to die along the way. Most, a few are going to get very big. A lot of the big banks, even now we admire and think they're like going to be here forever, are going to disappear. A few are going to be great success stories. But I think it's going to be the same as, in, as what happened in e-commerce. Um, it's like if we have, who's going to win, e-commerce or going to the shop? It's like if you ask Amazon or you ask Walmart, it's like. We have a digital part of our lives, and I think fi finance will just become like e-commerce. You don't know, you don't think about like what's an, like Ford is, right. a, is Ford an e-commerce? No, like Ford sells cars and they have a they have a digital site, and then Ford is gonna have a, is gonna have a fintech and they're gonna provide a financial service in a very it's seamless way to a fintech, to a bank, or somebody else. And the idea of a fintech is just gonna be like it's just air, it's like it's something we're surrounded. So let me just ask you guys one question to finish this. How many of you use a fintech, have a fintech app on your phone? Almost all of the audience. You know, 10 years ago, none of you would have had your hand up. So that's real progress that we've seen fintechs make in the world. And uh, on that note, thank, uh, let, join me in thanking the panel for a really interesting conversation.